watching Reason Live, streaming to you from Los Angeles. The following is a live, unedited conversation between the host, the guest, and the online audience. If you'd like to participate, please leave your question in the YouTube chat. The views expressed by guests and the audience members in this discussion do not necessarily reflect those of Reason. And now your host, Zach Weissmuller. All right, thank you for tuning in for day five of five of the first week of this live stream experiment. I'm Zach Weissmuller. We're going to be talking with Reason's own Nick Gillespie and Skeptic Magazine publisher and Scientific American columnist and author Michael Shermer. Uh, and we're going to be discussing postmodernism, uh, rationalism, skepticism, uh, maybe a little bit of the intellectual dark web, which Michael is part of or an associate of, according to the New York Times columnist Barry Weiss, at least. And uh, they'll be leading this conversation mostly. I might pop in once in a while to bring in your questions and also to some clips from a previous video that we made on this topic, which is really what this is kind of based on. We got a lot of interesting reactions to that video, which is called Libertarian Postmodernism. If, if you want to watch that video, uh, if you're watching this stream later and want to watch that first, the link is in the description. So you can take a look at that. And honestly, I'm surprised uh, at the amount of people who have watched it all the way through. It is a 40 minute video uh, talking about uh, postmodernism. So it's a it's an interesting time to be alive that this topic has uh, reemerged uh, for uh, good and ill uh, critics and fans. Uh, it's it's something that uh, people are talking about for some reason, and and maybe the discussion will touch on on why this is something that's even being discussed at this this particular moment in time. Um, before we get to that conversation, I just want to address a couple things. One is last night's stream with Christian O'Brien was taken down for a couple hours due to a what is in my mind a bogus copyright claim, but uh, it's back up now for you all to enjoy. Um, and uh, this the future of this stream uh, or this this experiment we're running with live stream conversations. Uh, we're going to revisit that in the new year. So this will be the last one of 2018. Uh, when we're making the decision as to whether to continue with this, we're going to be looking at a variety of signals. Uh, first of all, and most importantly, engagement, how many people are actually watching it and watching it you know, all the way through or, or most of the way through. Um, and uh, if so, first of all, if you've been watching these either live or later, you, thank you for doing that. That's giving us the signal that it is worth the time and energy to put this together and time or energy that, that could be put towards something else, producing the other products that, that we make at Reason. Um, so uh, the other thing that we'll look at is just the enthusiasm. So. You know, are people leaving good comments on the video? Are people excited about what we're doing? Uh, you can leave comments or you can email us. Uh, questions at reason.com is the email we've been using for this. Or you can uh, find me or Nick on Twitter and let us know if you like today's conversation or, or the previous ones. And also, honestly, just looking for feedback. if. If there are, this hasn't been perfect by any means, we're learning as we're going. And so if you have suggestions for how this could be better or um, guests or topics you would like to see, that's really what I see as the uh, big value of this kind of thing is getting that uh, instant feedback and making this a uh, participatory experience interactive. Um, so uh, in that vein, go ahead and start posting your questions for Nick and Michael uh, in the chat, and we'll be working those into the conversation as we go along. Um, and I want to start off this uh, conversation with a clip from that video that we made, uh, Libertarian Postmodernism, a reply to the intellectual dark web. Uh, so we'll take a look at that and then come right back with Nick and Michael. It's all they believe in is identity. There's no individual, man. That's gone with postmodernism. Postmodernism is actually pre-modernism resurrected. Postmodernists are not really interested in truth. The level of irrationality that grows out of this undermines uh, 
the opportunities for uh, doing something really significant and important. This leftist postmodern Marxist stuff, that this is the new religion. Show me a postmodernist at 30,000 feet in a, in a jet and I'll show you a hypocrite. If you're a postmodernist, just to have a discussion with someone like you, cisgendered male of power, you know, and, and white to boot, it's like that's, that's an evil act in and of itself. Okay, Nick and Michael, welcome to the stream. <laughs> Good to be here. Thanks. Uh, so that uh, that intro is just to show that this is a topic that's being widely discussed on the internet by a lot of different people, and notably by members of what's become known as the intellectual dark web. And uh, one thing that I had, uh, so Nick, you and I made that video together, right. and we had a, a long conversation about postmodernism, and I did come away, you know, with a few questions in my mind. Uh, you know, after having time to think and ruminate on it. So I want to kick it off with one of my questions and then bring in Michael to start asking his questions because I think he has a different perspective uh, from you as someone who's been a, a right. critic of postmodernism but also seemed kind of open to some of the arguments oh, you were making. I, I would actually, I would define myself as a, uh, if, if I'm going to use terms like modernist or postmodernist, I'm more of a postmodernist for sure. Okay, um, so here is uh, your, I want to start with just your, your definition, the definition you put out there of postmodernism, and then ask you a quick question about it. John Francois Leotard, he defined postmodernism as incredulity toward meta narratives, which means that you don't take knowledge or assertions of knowledge as a given, but rather you understand that uh, knowledge and wisdom and, and even scientific understanding of things. It's not something that you, you're walking around and you discover in the backyard. You stumble across it like you stumble across the Grand Canyon or a mountain or something. Rather, it's something that's produced by humans and as a result, it's contingent, it's limited. Incredulity toward meta narratives means that you are skeptical of these big stories that we tell about, well, this is the why the world is the way it is. This is why it's always been that way. This is why it always will be that way. Or alternatively, this is why the world should be this way, which just happens to comport with what I want. I see that phrase, incredulity toward meta narrative, as very simpatico with libertarianism. So incredulity towards meta narratives. Uh, the question uh, that I'd like to just have you, uh, wh what I'd like to have you define here is just that term meta narratives. Uh, what exactly do you mean by that? <laughs> I, you know, I think it's any large theory that seeks to explain either all or part of the universe. Uh, and by that, I mean uh, human society and things like that. So, um, you know, there there can be a single meta narrative, which, uh, you know, on a certain level would be something like uh, evolution or the theory of relativity. Uh, there can be in political contexts or, or say, uh, you know, there are macroeconomic meta narratives that people believe that seek to explain all economic phenomenon uh, using one or, you know, uh, multi factors and things like that. So a meta narrative, I'm using it in a shorthand, Leotard and other people who really kind of uh, conceived of postmodernism sometimes had specific categories that they would call i use it in a more shorthand of it's it's any large um kind of comprehensive theory that seeks to explain a particular phenomenon okay uh that's that's a great starting and, and point by the I way think. and yeah. I, I, i'm sorry to you know interrupt you, myself and you but you know libertarianism has a series of meta narratives that are worth <laughs> thinking about uh you know that the world works in a particular way that individuals work in a particular way uh reliably and predictably and the important thing I think about the phrase, and this is where I think the type of postmodernism that I'm drawn to is distinct from um, some of what is criticized as well as some of what is advocated by postmodernists or opponents of postmodernism is its incredulity. It doesn't mean that we don't need meta narratives or that some meta narratives are not better than others. It's just that we always need to be questioning. We always need to be kind of checking our uh, presumptions. Uh, and, and, you know, simultaneously, I mean, we're building a house and we're also constantly going down and making sure that the foundation is not starting to erode at the same time. Great. And so that's a great uh, working definition of the kind of postmodernism you're talking about. And I'd like to pass the torch to Michael yeah. here to take it uh, this this journey in any direction he wants. 
<laughs> right. Um, well, I watched your your show yesterday on a, on a long drive down to LA, and and I really liked it. I thought uh, Nick's pushing back a little bit against Jordan and and um, Joe Rogan, myself, and others is good. I mean that that is kind of the principle of postmodernism in a sense, as you're, you're you're using it. That is skepticism, which is you know what I do for a living. Um, to a certain extent, um, you know, we move toward truth or discovering truths about the real world, truths with a small t, uh, by these kinds of back and forth and, you know, uh, conjecture and refutation, as, as Popper put it. And, uh, but at some point, we, we do get closer to something that we're reasonably confident is probably true. So the meta narrative of the Big Bang origins of the universe, the meta narrative of the theory of evolution by means of natural selection, these are largely true and superior to other meta narratives that have come before uh, based on empirical evidence, based on testing hypotheses. And if enough people convert people working in the field scientists converge to a conclusion we can be reasonably confident that it's probably true again with a small t and so while it's good to be skeptical of meta narratives at some point it's also okay if they have a lot of evidence um to say well okay i think you know we're, we're converging on something here very likely to be true and so what those of us in the so-called intellectual dark web are concerned about is not getting to that last step just being in 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 incredulous for the sake of being skeptical as i prefer to say it well you know i i think that um you're right about well two things one is i i essentially agree with you um and people who <clears throat> refuse to say that something is factual or something is empirically verifiable um or kind of logically or conceptually uh, verifiable, um, you know, that's a problem because I think that's where you go into a realm of kind of uh, non-rational thought and everything becomes a kind of will to power to kind of mix right. registers right. of things. And it, and it oftentimes becomes very situational. Uh, but so I agree with you on that. But my question then is, Michael, where did you like, where did you start to emphasize truth with a small t rather than a yeah. capital t because f to me this is essentially the difference and you, uh, you invoked karl popper between modernism and postmodernism and i think postmodernism is very much a, a kind of well i was i was going to say it's an epiphenomenon of modernism but in fact i think it's the true kind of enlightenment ideal of seeking truth moving towards enlightenment but also decapitalizing everything um, so yeah. like, when did, when did you yeah. notice yourself or when did the scientific world stop talking with a capital T? Yeah. Uh, you know. Well, for me, when I entered a, a doctoral program in the history of science, uh, I was first in a, in a, a, a graduate program in experimental psych in the seventies. And then, uh, due to a, a series of contingencies, I ended up being a bike racer for about a decade and, and doing something completely different. And then I went back and got, got my doctorate in history of science. In between there, I had taken courses in anthropology back in the 70s in graduate school, and then I took another one. And so I'll just I'll just read to you what I wrote here in my book, uh, The Borderlands of Science. I wrote an essay about my my collision with with postmodernism and, and deconstruction. Uh, when I took a, a graduate seminar co-taught by an anthropologist and a historian, and both fields were being deconstructed by so-called postmodern literary critics and social theorists. Anticipating the kind of anthropology done in the 70s when I last studied the science, the customs, rituals, and beliefs of indigenous pre-industrial peoples around the world, people like uh, Napoleon Chagnon and his work with the Anamamo, I love that stuff. I was shocked and soon dismayed to find myself bogged down in such books as Michael Tossig's The Devil and Commodity Fetishism in South America, with such chapters as Fetishism and Dialectical Deconstruction, and The Devil and the Cosmogenesis of Capitalism. I couldn't figure out what was going on until the anthropologist announced his was a Marxist interpretation of history that sees the past in terms of class conflict and economic exploitation. And, and then I have a, a, a long passage here from the book that's just impenetrable to me. I, I just can't imagine. And so it, this was my first collision with this. And then um, when we started Skeptic in the early 90s and, and I started looking into the Holocaust deniers and creationists, you know, they were kind of being postmodern deconstructionists of the meta narrative of the Holocaust and of, of the theory of evolution. And I realized if you take this too far, 
then you can actually take it right into a classroom and go, look, our story uh, about the creation of the universe 6,000 years ago is just as good as the scientific one because there are no objective truths. And then you can get really crazy and go, okay. And then I end up writing a book about these guys denying history about Holocaust deniers. They just, well, our story that, you know, this was exaggerated and so on is just as good as the other historians because there is no objective truth. So that's what bothers, um, bothered me back when I first collided with it. And then the clips you showed of Jordan, for example, is emblematic of, of the, the kind of postmodern wars that are re-erupted again since the 90s is captured, I think, in John Haidt's got a nice lecture about universities making the transition from the search for truth to the search for, for, for social justice. And, and he's got a great, basically, challenge to them. You should just announce on your web page which one you want. Are you uh, helping students understand the truth? Or are you helping students um, learn how to be social justice warriors? And just, just be upfront about it, because that's what a lot of them are doing. And that's the so concern we have. Yeah, no, uh, you know, and it's a concern that I share because I, uh, you know, uh, when you look at the 19th century, say, and, you know, the, the, the great kind of the th arguably the three big thinkers who come out of the 19th century are Darwin, Marx and Freud. I think Darwin's meta narrative is the only one that holds up. Right. Uh, you know, at this point, and it's been heavily changed or heavily modified and adapted and, um, reinterpreted so that, uh, you know, and this, this gets to, I think the benefit of postmodernism and a kind of understanding of skepticism and that de capitalizing, you know, taking a capital T and turning it into a small T is that, um, throughout the 19th century and throughout a good chunk of the 20th century, there were people who, uh, used evolution or evolutionary theory and kind of, uh, you know, a, a what I think we would agree is a bastardization or a misunderstanding of Darwin and some of some of the implications of which Darwin himself didn't even understand that, you know, particular races were better than others and had a right, uh, you know, extrapolating from biology to uh, uh, politics to rule over other people, etc. Um, so to me that, you know, you, you didn't, uh, I understand your hesitation with postmodernism, but what does it mean to go from a capital T to a small T? And to me, this is why I find postmodernism particularly uh, simpatico. I don't think it's the same as libertarianism, but it fits very well. And, you know, my background in terms of, um, you know, my PhD studies were in literary studies where literary <laughs> critics deconstructed the literary canon. Um, uh, right. And it was... A couple, a couple of things of note. One is that what, what essentially what they did is they brought context back into um, the creation of literary meaning. And, and you know, this is one of the things where I think postmodernists are wrong. Uh, and this is something that I, I first read in Hayek, but that they're applying uh, kind of methodologies or an understanding of a field of knowledge in literary studies or in history, and then applying it, say, to, um, you know, physics or sciences that are a distinct type of knowledge and actually require a different way of understanding the world and possibly even truth. I think truth in math or physics is probably different than truth in philosophy in like living philosophy as opposed to logic or in literature. Um, I don't think there is such a thing as like the greatest writer of all time. What I'm interested in is the ways in which we use literature uh, and literary tradition and create literary tradition in order to um, have conversations and to find meaning in our lives, to express ourselves, to engage with people. And that's exactly what postmodernists were doing in literature, in literary studies starting, you know, arguably uh, it goes back further, but the, the high tide of this stuff really started hitting the uh, grad programs in the 70s and 80s uh, and early 90s when I was in school. And it, it was incredibly useful because it was a corrective to a really stale and boring understanding of literature with a capital L. And here, uh, for instance, I, I'm an Americanist, but uh, you know, we were taught there were five great writers that created something called the American Renaissance, which at the time it was happening, nobody, it, you know, the American Renaissance, which took place before the Civil War in literary terms, is something that was created in like the 1920s and 30s or 40s by people after the fact, recover, and then it was presented as if oh well you know what like we were just digging around in the backyard and like oh my look at this we found the american renaissance and going back and looking at what people at the time were reading why they were reading it how they were reading it and recovering that and creating what michel foucault who's you know one of the 
uh, bugbears of uh, anti-postmodernists would call a genealogy of knowledge rather than just a received, you know, kind of uh, set of commandments. Very, I, I find that very helpful. And I, again, I find it very simpatico with libertarianism in the, particularly when we start to talk about uh, kind of meta narratives of political power or political righteousness. Yeah, I read Foucault's book on, um, I, I forget the title, but it was something like the, the invention of mental illness. You know, me me mental yeah. illness was invented in Not madness and civilization. Or yeah, something. madness and civilization. Yeah, yeah. you know, madness, madness was invented in 1620 or something like that. You know, it's like, wait, what? Uh, I mean, we have some idea of brain chemistry and genetics, and schizophrenia is clearly a you know a, a brain disorder. It's a it's a malfunction of the neural networks and so on. What are you talking about? Okay, so I I steel manned his his argument. I tried to understand it, and he makes some good points that. You know, say something like uh, a more contemporary example, um, the kind of over prescription of ADHD medications to young children who may not really actually have some kind of brain disorder, but they're just active, you know, young boys that like to run around a lot and you force them into these rows of desks in classrooms for hours on end. Um, and the teacher can't control them. So they just they just medicate them up. OK, that would be an example of something that's you know, called a disease as if it's a medical condition, when in fact, it's just a social thing that we invented in the 90s to gain control over hyperactive kids. Right. Um, that, that would be an example that I would say Foucault is fair about. But then, then I was introduced to Thomas Saws in the 90s. When we started Skeptic, people said, oh my God, if you're a libertarian, Shermer, and if, you, and if, you, <laughs> you know, if you're challenging these, these uh, meta narratives, so to speak, you, you got to read Thomas Saws because he, right. he's a psychiatrist and he practices this and he shows that you know, there's no such thing as schizophrenia. It's like, okay, this is an example of, of a good idea, you know, the con contextual basis of scientific theories gone too far where you just say it's all invented. Well, it's not all invented. The narratives are structured around something that's really out there. Yeah, uh, well, and uh, you know, it's uh, interesting and in the original video that Zach and I did, we uh, talk about Saws and Foucault, um, partly because in the early 60s, along with R.D. Lang, and there were a couple of other people uh, who tended to be psycho psychologists, psychiatrists, anthropologists um, looked at the construction of mental illness uh, as a means of getting rid of people who, you know, were just annoying to the powers right. that be. And sometimes, right. you know, sometimes it's your family, sometimes it's political prisoners. I mean, there's a reason why in the Soviet Union, political prisoners were routinely uh, remanded to psychiatric institutions. Right. Right. Um, I, uh, and Saz and Foucault, Foucault's first teaching gig in America was at SUNY Buffalo in the uh, late 60s, mm -hmm. early 70s, and Saz was up in Syracuse, and they actually corresponded uh, a fair amount. I, I knew Saz a bit, and um, it's, um, I, I, you know, I agree. People say, who have a better understanding of, of, say, of, you know, brain chemistry and whatnot, that Saz went too far with what he was saying oftentimes, or that he stopped keeping up with advances in understanding you know, actual markers of disease. But he wrote a book called The Myth of Mental Illness. I mm -hmm. think that's powerful. And again, you know, you know, you, everybody can take everything too far. Um, there's no question of that. And to the extent the I think one of the most ridiculous examples, and I'm trying to remember exactly where it was from, uh, it might have been a journal uh, called October, which was a left wing publication. I don't know if it's still around, but where uh, during uh, kind of the AIDS crisis or the AIDS era, it hypothesized that, you know, the difference between a vagina and an anus was completely socially constructed um, <laughs> and that it was, you know, merely the way we talked about these things is what created the reality that then somehow ended up with AIDS infecting gay men. Um, mm. You know, and that's wrong. Uh, because there is, there are physical differences, and even if you're uh, heterosexual, you're more likely to, you know, get or at the time. I mean, we've kind of moved past into a post-AIDS era, but you know, the anus is not the same as a vagina in terms of intercourse, and there's more likely to have, you know, bleeding, which then leads to HIV transmission, et cetera. Right. So, you know, the, um, Alan Kors, the uh, uh, you know, the guy who wrote the book, the Encyclopedia of, of the Enlightenment for Oxford or Cambridge Press, retired from University of Pennsylvania. Um, I'm sure, uh, you know, we, we know him in common, but he once said, you know, there's a difference between talking about the social construction of reality, 
uh, which is what a lot of extreme postmodernists focus on. And they say everything is socially constructed. Reality is completely socially constructed versus the construction of social reality, mm. I think is where a postmodernist uh, understanding and incredulity toward meta narratives becomes really important. Um, and this is probably less so in the research sciences in terms of uh, you know, physics or certain aspects of biology and chemistry uh, and whatnot. And it's more in the way that science gets applied and then trickles into politics or trickles into different ways to control people's lives. Let me, yeah, let me uh, let jump me in real quick with one question I think is relevant oh, yeah. to this conversation that came in from the comments. <clears throat> um, and I'll also mention that uh, since you brought up Thomas Saz, uh, early next year, I am producing a, a documentary for reason on this very topic, kind of the history of uh, uh, Thomas Saz and what he got right and wrong and uh, how what insights apply in modern day and, and which ones we probably need to uh, push aside. So keep an eye on Reason TV for that uh, next early next year. But this question is from someone named uh, Simply Irresistible. Uh, and and uh, of course. <laughs> Uh, Michael Shermer brought up uh, the idea of steel manning, and this is uh, basically asking you to steel man the other side. To Nick, what is the biggest problem you see with postmodernism? To Michael, what is the biggest strength? So uh, Michael was about to talk, so let's start uh, with you, Michael. Oh, well, just parenthetically on Saz, I, uh, we, we published an article by him in Skeptic, because I'm always open to, to, to people that, that have counter views. Um, and uh, lo and behold, I found, I found, I found a, some supporters in, in Scientology that, that liked what we were doing about challenging psychiatry. I'm like, wait a minute, what? We're skeptical of Scientology. Why are they liking my magazine? Oh, that's right. They don't like psychiatry. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> the enemy of my enemies, my friend kind of thing, I guess, for them. Um, well, for me, uh, I think I already said it, that it, it's clear um, that the old idea, that sort of 19th century idea that historians, the, the job of the historian is to just to tell the past as it really was. Well, there's no such thing as as it really was. There, Obviously, you can't disentangle the historian from history. And, you know, the, 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 the narrative writer, you know, from the narrative, from the text, from the context that he's writing in, and she's writing in, and, and so on. So I think that's probably the best part of it. You know, when I exited my doctoral program in the history of science, I, I no longer held that view. My original view when I entered was that science is a uh, sort of progressing, like an asymptotic curve coming right up to, but not quite making the upper ceiling of truth with a capital T. We're, we're, get, we're gonna get closer and closer to it and pretty soon we'll get there. So I, I, I gave that up after the influence of postmodernism. Clearly that, that's not the case. But on the other hand, there still is progress. I mean, there's a reason why, for example, the Big Bang Theory won out over the steady state theory, uh, which were competing in the 50s and 60s, and it wasn't clear which one was gonna win out. But the evidence started piling up and piling up and by the uh, by the late 60s, early 70s, it was pretty pretty clear to every almost everybody, with a handful of exceptions, um, uh, like Fred Hoyle. Uh, who, who who named the Big Bang Theory um, just as as ir ironic, but it, it it stuck. And so, why did that happen? Why was there a convergence of uh, conclusions toward one theory than the other? And it's because the evidence is there, real empirical evidence. Not that, and, and not just that that I can see, that you can see, and you and you and you and it, anybody can go look at it and run the experiment, and so on. So um, we can get out of the postmodern trap that we'll never know anything by just recognizing that it's a social process of getting out of my head to make sure that I'm not deluding myself by having you look at what I'm looking at. And so the whole idea of empiricism and again, Popper's conjecture and reputation is I put it out there into the community and go, this is my theory. Tell me if I've gone off the rails, if I'm looking at something that might be real, and then you look and you look, and at some point we, we converge to a conclusion one way or the other. And I think that's where we're at now. And Nick, what would you say is the biggest weakness of postmodernism? I, I think Michael has touched on it. It's, you know, an intense, uh, I was almost going to say like an intense subjectivism, uh, it almost becomes a, a, a form of intellectual autism where nobody Nobody can understand 
the world uh, as I experience uh, or as the group that I claim to speak for, which I might invent uh, experiences and things like that. Um, and there is a there is a move towards the non-rational. I wouldn't even say irrational, but it's that, um, you know, the idea of if then statements or the idea of being able to submit the evidence of how you came up with your system of beliefs to uh, where you you kind of open up the data and you give people, you know, the you know, you show them what you did and you say, would you check my math for me? Would you proofread my way of thinking about the world? And I think a lot of the times the people who traffic in kind of postmodern lingo or jargon are that's something that they a move that they absolutely refuse to uh, engage in. And, and, you know, in a campus uh, context, it means shutting down speech. Um, and I don't even mean, you know, I'm not talking about somebody like Milo or Ann Coulter coming to campus, but really shutting down the intellectual work of engagement with people who disagree with you um, so that you can actually move towards a better approximation of reality. Um, and there is an objective reality out there, but, you know, and this is obviously a very old concept, but, you know, there's an objective reality out there that clearly impinges on us, uh, you know, if a, a you know, if a, something falls off a bill, a safe falls off a building and hits me, whether I see it coming or not, it, it hit me and killed me. Um, but how do we, how do we apprehend that? How do we comprehend that? And how do we make sense of it? Uh, the other thing that I would say is really is a problem, which I hadn't really thought about it until this conversation, but, um, in, um, uh, the counter revolution of science Hayek's book from the fifties, uh, called studies in the abuse of reason, where he kind of uses the French revolution as the paradigmatic enlightenment driven, uh, mania where people, you know, the French revolutionaries thought that they could redesign everything at will and just wipe out the past, literally wipe out the calendar, wipe out every distinction and just start over. Um, he talks a lot about what he calls scientism, which at, at one point he defines as the mechanical application of a system of knowledge to other things, which actually run by different rules. And I think in many ways, that's one of the problems with postmodernism. It really grew out of uh, history and literary analysis. Uh, and, and in certain ways, philosophy or the philosophy of science or historiography um, and things like that. And I think it, it very quickly was people started using it to level all discourse and treat all discourse exactly the same. And that's a problem because the whole point of postmodernism is actually that the world is, is more complicated than we think and that there isn't a single meta -narrative, meta narrative or a single system of knowledge that's going to explain everything. Yeah, let me read something I wrote here on that where it, it shifts from the biological to the physics and biology to social uh, sciences, which gets more complex. It is my hypothesis that in the same way that Galileo and Newton discovered the physical laws and principles around the natural world that really are out there, so too have social scientists discovered moral laws and principles about other about human nature and society that really do exist. Just as it was inevitable that the astronomer Johannes Kepler would discover that planets have elliptical orbits given that he was making accurate astronomical measurements and given that planets really do travel in elliptical orbits, he could hardly have discovered anything else. Scientists studying political, economic, social, and moral subjects will discover certain things that are true in these fields of inquiry. For example, democracies are better than autocracies. Market economies are superior to command economies. Torture and the death penalty do not curb crime and that burning women as witches is a fallacious idea, that women are not too weak and emotional to run companies or countries, and most poignantly here, that blacks do not like being enslaved, and that the Jews do not want to be exterminated. <laughs> and now how do we know those things? Well, you can just ask the people that are potentially affected, that, mm -hmm. that, are, that are going to be tortured or enslaved. They will tell so, you, I don't, I don't want that. So there, that's a kind of truth, I think. That's what I'm yeah. pushing toward. I, 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 you know, I, I agree with those truths, but we also will recognize that at various points, um, you know, you can submit those arguments to the, you know, to the world and they might not agree with you or to say something like autocracies are better than democracies, uh, perhaps morally, um, perhaps economically, not always or in, in a given period of time and whatnot. And I guess one of the questions um, that I have, and this was, you know, this, uh, the, I was interested in postmodernism when I was in grad school and I was expecting to become an academic. This was, and then I ended up getting a job at Reason and, you know, I'll get back to, you know, uh, you know, 
teaching at a university someday, I, I suppose. But, um, uh, you know, I was going to use postmodernism as a way to smuggle in Hayek and Mises in particular, mm -hmm. as well as Saz and a couple of other libertarian thinkers, because Michel Foucault, uh, uh, towards the end of his life, he actually, in some of his last lectures, spoke highly of uh, Mises and Hayek and said that his students should read them. And, and a kind of classical liberal, you're wearing a T-shirt, I don't know if viewers can see it, that says classical liberal, but that he was looking at classical liberalism in the 19th century as a way of hemming in certain types of power and social control. And I was like, okay, well, you know what, like, let's, Foucault in the late 20th century was the most widely cited scholar in most of the social sciences and, and uh, humanities. Uh, let's look at these guys he said were worth looking at. Um, my question for you, Michael, or, or a way of thinking about this is um, what, you know, where do those truths go once you start moving, you know, like, I think we would both agree that men and women are biologically different. They're, they're, they're evolved in different ways, uh, which are going to have ramifications on broad based behavior patterns. Um, how do we use science or how do we have a conversation that is informed by science, but then does not become overly deterministic because this yeah. is a yeah. little bit different than postmodernism per se, but it's, this is the problem I think that modernism had, which is that it very quickly devolved into hyper determinism. I think you see that more now on the left and kind of a Marxist left, even more than a postmodernist left. And we could argue about Marxism and postmodernism. When I was in grad school, these, they were, you know, the Crips and the Bloods, they hated each other. <laughs> right. One was scientific and the other was mush. But, you know, how, how do you, how do you check yourself so that you don't become deterministic? Yeah. Well, you did disentangle Marxism from postmodernism in your first conversation. And when you do that, postmodernism doesn't seem quite so um, dangerous, but in the minds of many people, I think they're not disentangled. So, for example, you'll see in that clip with um, with Jordan, you showed, um, you know, he's he's got them overlapped because that's what right. he sees in academia, uh, in part because so many academics are so far left leaning. Yeah. Uh, they don't always call themselves Marxists. Oh, and and if I might just inject, I mean, postmodernism, and I'm, I'm guilty of this too, is kind of a garbage term, right? Like where you right. use it for everything, everything that you either, I mean, the joke that Umberto Eco, the uh, novelist and philosopher uh, you know, who wrote uh, uh, um, uh, Name of the Rose and Foucault's yeah. Pendulum and, you know, is, is like one of the great kind of theorists of postmodernism. He said, you know, postmodernism is something that, you know, any people label it whatever they love. I think we're at a stage now, too, where it's people label everything they hate as postmodernism. Right. So. Yeah. Yeah. So the concern, uh, like to, to bring up a contemporary uh, issue that you mentioned was, you know, the difference between men and women. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm really afraid to touch that myself, uh, although I, I've touched on it a little bit, but Jordan got himself into so much hot water uh, for, for talking about that. It's, that's one of those taboo subjects now, but it, it's clear scientifically that obviously there's physical differences, but, but just on, on things that matter like um, why there are gender differences in the number of STEM field graduates and then jobs. Um, and it's clear that there's no intelligence difference between men and women. You know, the bell curve is, you know, the, the, the mean of the bell curve is the same. But when you look out at the spread of the edges, um, there, there's a wider diversity of men. The, the bell curve is spread more widely than it is for women. So as Pinker uh, says, it, uh, uh, like in mathematics, more geniuses it amongst men and more dunces amongst men. <laughs> so it, it, it's just, a, it's just a, a wider range bell curve. So you get more extremes. But if you then shift to something like interest, what are men and women interested in doing with their lives? Uh, there you see gen uh, dramatic gender differences that start pretty early, like in middle school when, and early high school when schools start giving kids vocational interest tests, like what are you interested in doing? And most kids have no idea. So they answer the 150 questions on the, on the, on the battery and see what comes up. Uh, the, the, the male female differences of the kinds of jobs, careers they would be interested in going into ends up being about the same percentage that they are into, you know, decades later. And so this is one piece of evidence that it's not intelligence as interest. What are you interested in doing? But what is the, you know, what is the reality of things that say, maybe not 
programming per se, which is a totally mysterious dark art to me, computer programming. But when you look at the culture of Silicon Valley or the culture of Wall Street or the culture of law offices or medicine that were created, uh, you know, and, and particularly maybe something like Wall Street or, or medicine, like they were created at a time when women were absolutely not allowed to pursue certain right. occupations and a culture workplace culture builds up, which then is seen as somehow, um, you know, God given as opposed to ma malleable or, or manipulable in a way right. that um, I think we're, we're seeing that, uh, you know, and this goes to your question of how truths with a small t kind of evolve and, and equality and individuality triumph over time. I think we're seeing, uh, you know, this, this is where I think understanding the uh, construction of social reality as something yeah. which does it, it's not unlimited, but it can change and it can change pretty quickly. Um, and I think in our lifetimes alone, um, you know, we probably have older relatives who uh, were smart women who became nurses because it was unthinkable that they would become doctors. And now right. they would become doctors. Um, yeah, now that the barriers are down, um, yeah. that they're, they're, last time I checked, I think there are just as many women MDs now as men. Uh, and there's certainly more in medical school and the same thing in the biological yeah. sciences. In the social sciences, like in psychology, it's like 70, 30 female male. Yeah. Uh, maybe 60, 40 in, in PhD programs, but it's clear. So the, the evolutionary psych explanation is, but, you know, boys are interested in things, girls are interested in people, um, you know, not across the board, of course, these are just average generalizations, but what it ends up um, resulting in is women are more likely to go into the helping professions, medicine, anything with people, and men are more likely to end up wanting to be involved with things. And programming, I'm told, because I'm like you, I have no idea. It's a, it's a, it's a dark art to me. Uh, but programming computers is more of a thing, a guy thing. than a, Anyway, this is the explanation. Right. Um, and it seems to me that as you lower the uh, barriers to entry, uh, whatever results, percentage differences results, that's reflecting probably more interest than, than say, ability. And, and also the other thing I, I'm gonna, that bothers me about these conversations is this idea that somehow being a Wall Street trader or a politician or somebody that works you know, 100 hours a week in a law firm to become a partner or in a medical practice, that, that, like that's the ultimate thing you wanna do. Uh, to me, working 100 hours a week, this does not sound like a high quality life. You know, to be the CEO yeah. of a major corporation, you know, for 30 years, you've got to work the, you know, the big, probably 80 hours a week is something like it. You know, who wants to do that? That's not much of a life. And so women are more likely to say, no, I, I'd rather work half time and spend time with my kids as a higher quality life. And somehow that's been transmogrified into, so you're saying that women can't work as CEOs? No. And, and, you know, Pinker also makes this point, you know, but, you know, why aren't there more women Caltech physicists winning Nobel Prizes or whatever? Because almost nobody could be a Caltech physicist or mathematician. Right. I mean, it's such a tiny, tiny percentage of the population that could do it that those extreme ends on the bell curve at the, at the genius end, those slight differences there are then reflected. That's the explanation. Uh, I, I want to throw in a question that was came up on the original video because this is what uh, a lot of the critics of postmodernism seem to be worried that it's undermining a lot of the assumptions upon which our very civilization is built. I think this comment kind of exemplifies it. It says, um, uh, here we go. Postmodernism implies that all previous generations knew nothing and that we know better. It's perfect for Maoist cultural revolution. We should be skeptical of established narratives, but an outright rejection of all narratives makes us extremely open to whatever the powerful today want us to believe, and they will change it at their whim. As expected, reasons rebuttal of Jordan Peterson are dismissed with prejudice. So uh, yeah. this idea yeah, yeah. of uh, cultural Marxism that you hear people like Jordan Peterson talking about, is that a legitimate concern in any either of your minds? Uh, you know, I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, I think, uh, you know, one of the things that postmodernism actually valorizes is uh, what a, um, a, an American literary critic from the 20s or 30s, uh, Van Wyck Brooks, called a usable past. It, it, 
it valorizes rummaging through the past to find examples of the uh, of the kind of world that you want um, or that uh, that um, kind of is a premonition of the world that you want um, or that might be. And to go back and look at kind of counterfactuals, uh, you know, that you could spin out of history. So in a way, I think uh, I, I would argue that postmodernism for me, I, again, thinking about stuff like uh, the revision of the literary canon, it didn't mean getting rid of standards. What it meant was going back and opening up more books and reading more books. You read all of the received wisdom and then you see what else is out there that it's worth talking about. Um, so I think properly understood, it's the exact opposite of that. It's actually inoculation against the idea that the way the world that you were born into is the way the world always was and always should be. Um, I would argue that, but it is true. Yeah. I think, you know, a lot of people constantly want to just will away, you know, any, any sense of history. And that's always a problem. Hmm. And Michael, what do you think of that? Because yeah. uh, Peterson obviously is very concerned with the power of myth and that, you know, our civilization is, is built on a certain religious outlook. And as a skeptic, I imagine you have some problems with it, but I'd like you to tackle that and the cultural Marxism argument. Yeah, the, so your, your interlocutor there, um, he's reflecting something like what uh, Edmund Burks wrote about in his uh, analysis of the French Revolution, that you can't just throw everything from the past out and start over because those people figured out some things that work, some things that weren't such a great idea like slavery, but other things, it, it's certain social institutions that maintain a society, stability of a society, and the French Revolution went too far in throwing all that out. He supported the American Revolution because there was a, a balance there. The French Revolution went too far. So, so I, like I, liberté, I, égalité, but the uh, or rather liberté and fraternité were pretty good. Égalité, yeah, definitely yeah, the egalité was, part. Yeah. That, right? Now back to Jordan. Um, so I, I know Jordan pretty well. Um, I like most of what he says. Um, but he kind of flirts with some postmodernism when he talks about the power of myth. And you mentioned his a podcast with Sam Harris, uh, which I listened to. It was just you know painful to listen to um, that you know he could you know that Sam could not get him to say you know this is really absolutely true. Like <laughs> Sam's great example was um, you know there is a correct order of U.S. presidents, starting with Washington and Adams and Jefferson and so on. And uh, but let's say that a, a group of you know ISIS fighters have captured. Uh, somebody and they're torturing them and they have to give the correct order of the presidents of the United States or else we're going to uh, detonate a nuclear bomb in, uh, in Los Angeles. And, 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 but the terrorist has an incorrect uh, s uh, memory of the, of the sequence of presidents. So the, cap the captured person has to give the incorrect version. And, and, and Sam could not get Jordan to say there's an actually a correct sequence of U.S. presidents. And the terrorist has the incorrect uh, version of this. And, and this went on and on back and forth. And it's like, what is, what is his, uh, what's the holdup with acknowledging that, that power, story. that power, uh, that power constructs narratives. It's really the postmodernism stuff. And, well, yeah. it's, you know, uh, uh, let me ask you in terms of evolutionary uh, psychology or thinking about that. Uh, also, Peterson, uh, it, to me, it's not an accident that he's at University of Toronto, where Northrop Frye, a, a literary critic and cultural critic who, who kind mm. of created archetypal criticism, uh, came out of her Cleanth Brooks as well. Other people like that. Camille Polly is very indebted to this. But what what do you think of archetypes? I mean, are archetypes an emanation of a biological, of an evolutionary kind of uh, collective consciousness, or is that also mumbo jumbo? That is I think it's mostly mumbo jumbo. I th I think it's a kind of classific classification we impose on nature of sorting animals into certain categories and plants into certain categories and things like that. That's perfectly, uh, that makes perfect sense from an evolutionary perspective. Yeah. Uh, from there, you can start conceptualizing ideas into categories, which, you know, can make some kind of sense. Um, that's kind of a form of abstract reasoning. Um, where I think Jordan gets a little messy is, is when you ask him, like, do you believe in God? And, you know, his answer, you, you ask me that, I go, no, 
you ask, ask him that, and he goes, that would take me 40 hours to answer. It's like, why? Well, what do you mean by belief? And what do you mean by God? And like, for example, Jesus was resurrected. Okay, so people like me and Dawkins say, no, he, he was not resurrected. That would be a miracle of violation of natural law. But you're, you're conceding he existed. So you've- Well, I, I do like, concede that. But, there. that. but for Jordan, he, you know, he wants to say something like, Jesus is a archetype of absorbing the sins of the past and redemption starting over, you know, he's got this whole story and, and that's really true. It's like, well, okay, what do you mean by true? I mean, as an archetype, as an idea, yes, I get that. Um, you know, the, the idea of Jesus dying for me and redemption starting over the flood myths, for example, whether it's true, it's probably not true, but it represents some kind of truth. Like, you know, people can start over and rebuild their lives. And so if you read a novel that inspires you to do this, or you read a, a religious text like the Noachian flood or the Jesus story, it's kind of a destruction, redemption, we're starting over. Um, and, and that's true for you. Okay, I get that sort of metaphorically or archetypally, but not true scientifically, not empirically true. Right. Do you, um, you know, I, one of the things, have you ever been to the Creation Museum uh, outside yeah. of Cincinnati? Yeah, I have, yeah. Um, <laughs> and I'm forgetting the name of the guy, Keith, whatever. Uh, Ken Ham. Uh, Ken Ham, yeah. Um, uh, I mean, you have to uh, consider it an, an enormous concession that that whole museum, which is extremely well done, and I, I find it enjoyable, and not simply on an ironic level, although it's mostly <laughs> ironic, yeah. um, that, you know, that they're arguing in scientific terms, like they're using the language and at least right. the appearance of science and logic in order to make their case. Um, it seems to me that that's a gigantic concession. And I am curious if you- Well, that, that, that's right. Um, before, like a century ago, no one really cared about scientific discoveries in terms of their implications for religious belief. Some did, but most didn't because most weren't basing their religious beliefs on facts and evidence and empirical reasoning and arguments and logic and all that. It was just what they believed. So this is a very modern idea that science is now the power narrative. And if you want to have power in culture, you have to use that narrative to get your message out. So at the sci at the Creation Museum, you go in there, and as you, you may recall, there's two, two pathways you can go down, the science pathway, and you end up in this room where there's, you know, sex, drugs, and rock and roll, and euthanasia, and abortion, and, you know, it's just, uh, you know, the, the culture has gone to hell in a handbasket, yeah. all thanks to, you know, Darwin. And then you go down the other pathway, and you end up Jesus and heaven and love, and everything is great. Um, so they, they're really kind of postmodernists in a, in a way, as you've defined it. They're saying the meta narrative you tell ends up, it's it's not a it's not a just a hypothetical interesting discussion about DNA or the age of the earth. It it, it has implications for politics, economics, ideology, beliefs, life and death, morality, where you end up after you die, and so well, on. Do you do you also believe that though? Because I guess one of my questions, and the, uh, this conversation has been helpful uh, for me. I mean, to kind of clarify this idea of taking a you know what, I mean, kind of arbitraging a system of knowledge developed in one field and then putting it into another. Sometimes that can yield a really interesting analysis. Other times it can lead to confusion and I, I like categorical confusion, which I think when postmodernists, and I, I think in the clip that Zach showed at the beginning, uh, he was talking about, or you were talking about, you know, show me a postmodernist <laughs> at 30,000 feet and I'll show you a hypocrite. Um, I think I came back to something along those lines of uh, saying like, yeah, that, you know, that's, you know, it's true, but like, what does aerodynamics, the science of aerodynamics, and there are certain wings, there are certain engines, there are certain, you know, measurements that are more efficient and more effective and keep us from crashing. And we can, we can model these and predict these and retrodict things and everything. But what does that have to do with uh, living a meaningful life, which is really ultimately the arena in which, um, we're going to spend most of our lives. So, you know, yeah. what, what does astrophysics have to tell us about, you know, whether or not our, our, our you know, our children should, uh, you know, become doctors or lawyers yeah. or, or not? So here, here, let's get back to that charge of scientism, which I, I'm guilty of. Um, I think the mistake here is thinking that w w when you're talking about like bridging the Izzat gap and, 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 and using science to find meaning and morality, 
uh, here we're not talking about science like ichthyology. We don't turn to the ichthyologist to, to find out what the meaning of life is or, or what's good and evil or what's right and wrong. Here I'm just talking about the whole body of the Western tradition, science and philosophy, and throw in theology and, and literature and the arts, everything we know. Uh, will you about, throw in religion in there? Yeah, I would throw in religion because, the, you know, they were there before science, and they've been thinking about these things a long time, and they didn't have a, a systematic method to get at the truth, so to speak, the scientific method. But through trial and error, they figured out some things that were better than other things, and so and, and some religions are better at this than others. I, I, I think because... Christianity went through the Enlightenment, it came, it came out more civilized. It's become, you know, re reasonably supportive of most moral um, uh, civil rights movements and things like that. They're slow to change, but Ju uh, Judaism is probably my, my top pick. If I was going to be religious, it would be maybe a Jew, e even more than a Buddhist. Um, and, and most of the Jews I know, they're atheists, but they still, you know, the cultural tradition, back to Burke's idea that there's certain things people have discovered in the past we should hang on to because they work. By work, what do we mean? Uh, you know, less violence, more prosperity, a more stable society, these sorts of things. We know that cer certain things work better than others, just like we know planets travel in ellipses. Mm -hmm. And so there's some value there, I think. Uh, I would uh, yeah. tend to agree. And I think, uh, you know, one of the things that uh, I was I was raised Catholic, um, in a Catholic tradition, like a Jewish tradition and like a Protestant tradition, a Reformation Protestant tradition is a uh, skepticism actually towards meta narrative. I mean, they're yeah, constantly, yeah. you know, getting together and arguing about the finest, you know, every jot and tittle. I mean, <laughs> uh, some of my best friends are uh, biblical literalists. And one of the things that I, as I became more interested in literary criticism that I found was a, um, you know, a, a kind of common ground was like a real interest in understanding a text. And, uh, you know, they would talk about how every jot, you know, that God breathed every jot and tittle into the King James Bible, which strikes me as a, a ridiculous statement. Um, mm -hmm. You know, every comma and every period, every punctuation mark, much less the longer passages. And um, that is a good, that, that you know, regardless of how it's being done, uh, you know, that process of kind of being conscious and trying to, to ferret out a better understanding of what, you, uh, what you're looking at, I think is a good one. Yeah. So if you find value in Jane Austen or Shakespeare or whatever like that, Dostoevsky, you know, Jordan loves Nietzsche and Dostoevsky. Well, there, there was no brothers Karaz, Karamazov in Russia that I know of, but it's irrelevant. That's not the right question. You know, right. uh, is it true? You know, is, is that an accurate, true history of the modernization of Russia in the 19th century? It's that, that's the wrong question. It's irrelevant. That, that, you know, a lot of people that, that, that send us articles about, I have an explanation for the Noachian flood. It was, a, you know, a meteorite or a volcano, you know, whatever. Or Jesus didn't really die. You know, when he was up there on the cross, somebody gave him some stuff that knocked him out and his heart rate was super low and they thought he was dead, but he wasn't. Then he escaped and he went to France and, you know, and so on. It's sort of a Dan Brown novel kind of thing at this point. But but, but to me, they're, they're, they're going down the wrong path. I mean, I like the scientific approach to these sorts of things. Let's find a natural explanation for this apparently supernatural phenomenon. But maybe there's nothing to explain. Maybe the stories are just mythic. They're archetypal stories that represent something. People just make up the story to, to deliver some kind of moral homily or message that is true in that sense, but not true in a historical scientific sense. And uh, another question came in that I think goes to what you were talking about, Michael, and, and maybe challenges it a little bit. Uh, I mean, you wrote a book called The Moral Arc, which I uh, interviewed you about, and uh, Sam Harris also uh, seems to have, uh, and I don't know if you this is a correct characterization of your beliefs, but that there are kind of moral goods that can be rationally derived. And one of the questions that just came in from, D4N Nabel, why should we care about individualism or egalitarianism, et cetera? Why not attempt to make the state as glorious as possible? All those questions can't be answered by science. Uh, what say you? I, uh, he's wrong. I mean, we, we know what happens when the state gets glorified and the collective is put uh, over the individual. Um, we have tons of historical experiments. The experiment has been run and they're almost always catastrophic. I mean, not almost always, always. Uh, 
Now, if it's a tiny little commune of, you know, 20 people in 19th century Kansas or something, you know, it's relatively harmless. People have a lot of sex and they get their feelings hurt and the cult leader ends up absconding with the money, whatever. But if you scale that up to the big communist experiments in the 20th century, then you end up with 100 million dead. And the problem is that it's too easy to rationalize why we need to suppress those individual rights over there or even get rid of those individuals in the name of this greater good, this collective, you know, kind of archetype of, of, of the state as representing us and all that, then it's too easy to sacrifice people. Um, and that's what leads to, you know, major body counts in genocides and, and wars. So, yeah, we know that's wrong. And would you yeah, agree that um, in certain profound ways, and I think I, I interviewed uh, Steven Pinker about Enlightenment now, and I think one of the relative weaknesses of the book, uh, which I think is fantastic, and it's one of the, the you know the best uh, things I've read in, in memory, in recent memory, uh, is that things like the Gulag, things like, in a way, Nazism, were participating in a broad Enlightenment narrative in the, in the sense of like when you were talking about how uh, you fetishize the state and everybody has to, uh, everybody becomes kind of data in or, in, you know, some kind of integer in the um, formula for greatness and for, you know, for collective greatness and whatnot. Um, and it seems to me that recognizing, and this is something where postmodernism, uh, you know, I think this is one of the ways that that capital T truth was demoted to a little t, was that uh, people understood pretty quickly uh, in the 19th and early 20th century that it's very easy to start kind of losing your perspective and like you have the truth and then you want to impose the truth on the world and it ends very poorly. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Although in the case of the Nazis and, and the communists, uh, this was more of a post enlightenment romanticism movement, yeah, yeah. blood and soil and, and, you know, the kind of elevation of the people, the folk uh, to something grander than the individual. Yeah, no, I, or and yeah, it's it, it's simultaneously both pre-modern and kind of post-modern. And then I guess I, you know, I, what is a, a more accurate way of putting it is that then they used the kind of fruits of, uh, you know, kind of modern uh, industrial technique in order yeah. to really kind of get where they were going in in a relatively efficient and like grotesquely effective way. Yeah. Here's the way I, I phrased it. Um, some of my critics are, are accusing me of basing my ideas on weird Western, educated, industrialized, rich and democratic culture. Uh, that, that That's my embedded uh, a presumption about a moral progress. So I write, sure, future scientists may one day discover that humans do not have an instinct to survive and flourish, that most people do not want freedom, autonomy, and prosperity, that women want to be lorded over by men, that animals enjoy being tortured, killed, and eaten, that some people like being enslaved, and that large populations of people don't object to being liquidated in gas chambers. But I doubt it. <laughs> okay, so where, I think... Where do you take... The, uh, where does the family... Uh, and kind of shifts in family life. Because again, and, and, and I'm thinking about this in terms of a kind of, uh, you know, science that is flavored by postmodernism. So that you, we recognize that uh, if evolution is true, we're evolved to have tighter kinship ties to people mm -hmm. who are closer to us genetically or, you know, that we grow up with. But then also we recognize that there's an a wide variety of family units and even within our lifetimes and certainly within you know the, the lifespan of the of uh, the united states exactly how family is constituted how it is defined and what it means can change um how you know so we know you and i are both good libertarians we we don't like the state we don't like the collective we don't like you know probably you know the group uh, is important but it should be voluntarist and whatnot but then how like how far down can you burrow into the family being a kind of voluntarist unit rather than something that is dictated by evolution? Yeah, there I, th I think the evolutionary psych um, tendency is to see the family as a, an extension of your genetic autonomy. It's, it's different than any other collective. Although, you know, hunter-gatherer groups are small enough um, that, 
everybody you know, that everyone in the group knows each other pretty intimately. And, and, and if there's not genetic ties, there's at least a lot of reciprocity that has gone on. Uh, and so you get reciprocal altruism along with kin selection as kind of binding the group together. The, the challenge comes from uh, extending the family and extended family to much larger communities and societies. Once you break uh, Dunbar's number of 150 or so, and you end up with 1,000 or 10,000 or, or a million, uh, then those, then you need some kind of external um, networks of trust uh, for people to be able to function. And so the, the long debate, as we know, uh, you know, well, we need a state. Well, maybe we don't need a state. Maybe, you know, you can get these kind of bottom up um, self-organized uh, principles like in the West where miners and ranchers just drafted their own contracts and agreements. Sometimes that works. Sometimes that doesn't work. Sometimes you end up with bottom up mafioso gangs just fighting it out and, and levels of violence go way up. Um, so that that's where I have to say, you know, solving the problem of uh, the social problem of cooperation in large groups is really hard. Um, I want to go ahead and uh, just uh, we're coming to the end of the stream, but there was one persistent a reaction that we got to the original video that I'd like especially Nick to address, and that is that we were more or less straw manning um, the other side uh, and not really talking about the same postmodernism. And in this conversation, you've already uh, conceded that postmodernism is a garbage term. Uh, but uh, maybe we could just talk a little bit more about that and then uh, wrap up soon. Uh, here's one example of such a comment. Stupid video. This is a 40 minute long straw man of Peterson's views on postmodernism. Nick basically redefines postmodernism as it was originally intended instead of addressing the bastardized version of postmodernism, which Peterson and others are obviously criticism there saved you 40 minutes. Um, and then I was talking yesterday uh, with um, Christian O'Brien of uh, 1791, a, a YouTube channel, and he was wondering if we're just conflating postmodernism with skepticism, and should we just be talking about skepticism? So any response to that, Nick? Um, you know, you, you have to define your terms. Uh, and, you know, I was using the you know, the incredulity toward meta narratives, which I think is a really good working definition of postmodernism. And it's in the work that really introduced postmodernism to, uh, you know, into intellectual discourse. So I, I stand by that. Um, there is no question that, you know, when I think when when people start saying, look, you know, left wing postmodern Marxist, you know, blah, blah, blah like you know something is going on there uh, and it's not what the railing against might absolutely be true when um i i find um you know or uh, in one of the clips you know that you that you showed in our video zach uh where uh jordan peterson said that the individual disappears in postmodernism like i i think that's just factually wrong i i don't I don't see that at all as deriving from the assumptions of postmodernism or even the ways that it's often applied um, in, in, in the way that he means it. Having said that, you know, on college campuses today, there is a, you know, people appropriate or, or either get charged with being postmodern or, or say that they are in terms of saying that everything is will to power, that there are no logical arguments, that all you do is you shut down uh, you know, either you're being shut down by the powers that be because you have a conversation they don't want to hear, or you are the person shutting that down. I don't know how you get around that. And what do you think, Michael? Is there a straight line from postmodernism to the campus identity politics and what I think Peterson calls, you know, power games? Uh, is that a straight line? And uh, is that a legitimate criticism of postmodernism? Maybe Nick will clarify, but it's called Marxist postmodernism or something like that, mm. uh, you know, because there's probably different types uh, that, you know, so Jordan's reflecting that kind when he's talking about what's going on in the academy. Yes, I mean, for sure, that's that that's this whole idea of power structures and the oppressed and the oppressor and, you know, the oppression Olympics, as it's sometimes called now. Um, and, you know, that's the kind of thing that's being discussed, at least on some campuses. Um, I, I don't think it's epidemic on all campuses, but it's, it's widespread enough that we should be concerned about that. And it's particularly when it spills over into the sciences like biology, 
you know, how many sexes are there? How many genders are there? You know, these are slightly different questions. And when you get into the gender issue, you know, it's tied to biology, but to what extent, you know, does culture play a role? Obviously some, but part of that, I think, you know, just sort of close out here for, for, for what I have to say about this is that it's this kind of binary thinking we're in where we want to put things in boxes and categories. Okay. So there's two sexes, there's two genders, that's it. I mean, you know, Ben Shapiro, he rants it. It's right. really funny the way he rants about this, but we, but that's that categorical thinking that there is a, a slight spectrum of like less than 1% of the population has these genetic or hormonal differences that uh, make it a little fuzzier. Okay, we should recognize that and say, okay, you know, 0.057% of the population is not clearly male or female, fine. Uh, they don't fit in either box and that's okay. In science, you can have these kind of spectrums uh, and you don't have to put things just in boxes. And I think that kind of categorization of things into boxes gets us into, into trouble. And Nick, I, uh, you know, yeah, uh, to uh, just pick up on that, I think, uh, you know, one of the great things about the 21st century and about uh, intellectual life in the 21st century is that I, I would like to think in my more optimistic moments that we're replacing binary thinking or, you know, either or thinking with spectrum as, as a concept in a lot of different ways. And, um, you know, as, as a description of reality, because, uh, and, you know, uh, Zach, I think we talked about this in the original thing. I'm actually a big fan of intersectionality, which originally is a term that was used in feminist uh, critiques of power and whatnot. Uh, and it ends up often being the worst kind of identity politics where you stack up all of your partial overlapping identities. And then, you know, whoever has the most oppression points or who is from the most, the least empowered <laughs> group gets the most power. That's a problem. Having said that, as a way of understanding who we are and what makes us up and what communities we belong to, what identities we have, it's, I think it's a, it's a fantastic, very postmodern way of understanding. If modernism is the idea that one theory or one idea can explain everything, postmodernism is that actually we need more than one because we're more complicated as individuals. And, and to Michael's point, it's you know, again, for me, I guess, and this is partly because I, I, I'm not a scientist, so I don't have to worry about these things as much, but it is kind of when we start talking in terms where we take supposedly hardcore scientific truths that are immutable, uh, which, and they're always contextual, ultimately, on some level, at least in the language we use to describe them, what happens when we put that into a social or political order? And particularly, uh, you know, Michael, I would love to have this conversation of like, where does your individualism come from? Where does it spring forward forth from? Because is it evolution or is it, you know, is it nature? Is it nurture? Is it, you know, your mother, when you were, when she was pregnant, had a particular type of mumps or measles and you came out an individualist? Is it epigenetics? I'm not sure where mine comes from, but that's the question, uh, you know, that I'm, I'm, I'm kind of obsessed with. And to mm. me, this is where postmodernism, obviously, it can be used, I guess, like everything, it can be used to shut people down or it can be used to kind of rethink things and really challenge the ability of the state or or the corporation or the family. You know, all these different sites of potential repression and oppression, as well as empowerment, to be quite yeah. honest. Uh, you know, like that's yeah. the conversation that um, I think well, postmodernism we'll, yields interesting results for. We will have that conversation on my Science Salon podcast in, in, in a few <laughs> days or weeks. But, um, it, it, but you brought up intersectionality theory. You know, this is, again, another example of a good idea just taken too far in the academy it, that that really does end up being the oppression olympics and by the way that term was coined by a um, latina feminist activist who warned her followers don't turn this theory intersectionality theory into oppression olympics which is exactly what's happened so the, pr the problem is is when you put it into action uh, from just the theory. So if a black man says to me, a white man, Shermer, you have no idea what it's like to be a black guy in America. He's right. I don't. I, I know I have privilege. Uh, being a middle-aged white guy driving a Tesla around Santa Barbara, I know I'm not going to be assaulted. I know the police aren't going to shoot me. You know, I, I just, I, I'm relieved of all those things that I know, uh, say, a black guy has to worry about. But a, a black woman could then say to the black guy, you don't know what it's like to be a woman, much less a black woman, and you know, and she's right, you know, and so on. And you can just start. How about the premise of a John Lennon Yoko Ono song from the early seventies? Woman is the n word of the n word of the world because she's the slave to the world's slaves. 
Um, oh, I mean, right, I, right. I forgot about that. that. We'll talk about that. Song you probably so could. A white guy probably couldn't sing that song now, unless you just said "n word." Yes. Uh, <laughs> I want to wrap this up uh, with just uh, Nick. You uh, mentioned earlier, and in our video also, that this is in many ways a way for you to kind of smuggle in talking about people like Hayek and. Um, you, near the end of his life, apparently Foucault was a fan of Hayek. And I want to just uh, play a short clip of Hayek that was featured in that video and then really have you explicitly draw that connection for us um, to finish us out. So here uh, is a little uh, bite from uh, Friedrich Hayek. Socialism assumes that all the available knowledge can be used by a single center of authority. It overlooks that the modern society, which I now prefer to call the extended order, which exceeds the perception of any individual mind, is based on the utilization of widely dispersed knowledge. And once you are aware that we can achieve that great utilization of available resources only because we utilize the knowledge of millions of men, it becomes clear that the assumption of socialism that a central authority in command all this knowledge is just not. Okay. Can you tell me, I, Nick, you know, uh, about... One thing I got to yeah. say, those eyeglasses are back in uh, <laughs> yes, So, uh, you know, he was a hipster. <laughs> um, well, that, you know, in a, in a way, that was one of the things that I think Foucault, Michel Foucault, was particularly drawn to. He ultimately rejected classical liberalism or, or liberal uh, kind of enlightenment uh, uh, hedges on power. He didn't think that they worked enough or that it, it was not quite up to the task. But I think, you know, what Hayek is tapping into there is a rejection of 19th century uh, you know, the worst strains of 19th century enlightenment thought. And I think in the in the person of Marx and to a certain degree, Freud as well, you saw that kind of hubris um, fully formed later in, in the 20th century where central authorities did start to say, we can control everything. We can control the price. We can control, you know, the, the time or the, you know, the time zones and things like that. Um, so I think, uh, you know, if, if in fact, Michael, um, you know, went from uh, starting grad school in a period where truth with a capital T was a live option. And then when he came back to it, it was truth with a small T. I think it's partly because Hayek, uh, who is very much in a uh, following, he was heavily influenced by Karl Popper. Uh, they were together, I guess, uh, for a while at Cambridge. Um, but they, uh, you know, by Popper's understanding of uh, the limits of knowledge. And I think that that's you know, that's the best part of postmodernism, that it's right at the minute when you're about to throw the kill switch and, uh, you know, turn, you know, you know, either like, you know, create the gulag or, you know, let the, you know, the dam wash over, you know, water wash over an entire society or civilization that lived in a valley forever because you know you're going to do the right thing for the greatest number of people. I think, you know, that, that, thought in our mind that says, hold on, we really ought to, we ought to run the math again. We ought to check our, our math. I think that's a tribute to Hayek. And I think that's postmodernism at its, at its best. Great. Well, that's a great closing remarks. Uh, any final thoughts from you, Michael, before we wrap up? Oh, that was a perfect way to, 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 to wrap it up. I, I am deeply concerned uh, about the Chinese uh, movement toward planting like a hundred million cameras all around the society to, to try to to solve the Hayek yeah. problem of knowledge. Yeah. We, we're going to know what every single person does every minute of the day, and then we're going to reward them points or, 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 or discredits uh, for everything that they do. That, you know, they, they, there are people still trying to do this, and they, they have the kind of technology now that, the, you know, the, Germ the East German Stasi could only dream of uh, in terms of knowing what everybody's doing. So we have to keep pushing back against that. Well, uh, thank you both for this uh, really enlightening conversation. I think this uh, showed the potential of this form, and I hope that you, those of you who watched agreed. I mentioned uh, in an earlier stream that I was thinking of this week as a kind of sample platter, so I tried to get a little bit of Lenore Sk Skenazy talking about parenting, some psychedelics, mm. uh, a philosophical conversation between Nick and Michael to cap it all off. And I hope you enjoyed it. I, I know I did. Uh, like I said, we'll be taking a look at 
if it makes sense to continue this. And part of that is going to be reading the signals, the viewership, the engagement. So let us know through all those avenues, commenting, email, Twitter, whatever, if, if you like it or if there's anything that you would like to see done differently uh, or <coughs> guests that you would like to see come on the show. But for now, uh, we'll leave it there. And uh, see, uh, we'll see you in the near uh, on Reason TV and in any case with our regular programming, documentaries, interviews, Stossel videos, Remy videos, all your favorite stuff. So thanks again for tuning in, everybody, uh, and have a happy holiday and happy new year. Mm -hmm.